Hello, let's continue making a top-down city-based car crime game. In the first part of this series, I developed a little prototype really just to test the power of the pixel game engine and the 3D rendering. And over the last few months, it's grown into something quite substantial. Here you can see the graphics have had quite a significant overhaul, and we've got non-player entities wandering around our city. We've got pedestrians marked in the pink dots and vehicles marked in the yellow dots. There's no collision detection just yet. But what's nice to see is that we actually have traffic patterns forming. So here we can see the pedestrians uh, walking around on the pavement and we can see the traffic queuing up and obeying the laws of the road. At any one time there's a maximum of 20 non-player units wandering around on the map and they spawn and despawn when not in view of the camera. 20 is a rather arbitrary number, but I feel it gives a good level of density, because uh, don't forget, we've got to allow the player space to actually drive the car around without hitting every obstacle in sight. Now, the first thing I will say is that everything has been overhauled from the first video. There's not much of the original code left, but there's plenty of the original ideas. And if I go into edit mode now in the uh, editor, we can see there's quite a great deal of complexity regarding how the non-player characters uh, manipulate themselves around the map. And I should also point out the buildings have changed. Yes, the, the texture is a bit high frequency, I appreciate that. And we may consider filtering later on. Um, but what I wanted to get across here is that all of the models, including the car, uh, are now uh, assets generated by the One Lone Coder community. So if I zoom in on the car for a second, we can see it's actually a 3D model. And it's got some uh, directional lighting applied to it too. It's very subtle. I'll just go back into edit mode. And we can see that there are nodes and a network uh, that the non-playing characters uh, follow around. And uh, the green nodes mean that they can pass through it, and the red nodes mean that they can't. So in this way, I can emulate sort of a traffic light sequence. The editor hasn't changed a great deal in terms of how it functions. We can still select multiple cells and place new uh, entities on the map. So I'll draw some road here, and we have a loop of road. But we'll see that there's no non-player characters on there. In fact, they're all clustered around the current centre of the camera's viewing point. There we go. So when I zoom out, we can see them pop in and out of existence. If I move down here, we can see now that where the camera is focused is where the non-player character entities appear. I'm just going to follow these around a little bit, so excuse the uh, silent pauses, but it does take a bit of time for things to happen. Now, the player during normal gameplay wouldn't see the units pop in and out of existence, uh, simply because the camera is restricted to a fairly local field of view, and the boundary for spawning and despawning of the non-player entities uh, is beyond that field of view. So to the player, it looks as if everything is running around quite smoothly. Ah, good, we can see the traffic has stopped at the traffic lights here. We'll just wait for this one to tick over and see how the cars behave. Now, I've decided that the traffic lights are running a particular sequence, and this sequence is, is highly modifiable. Uh, so right now it's completely dumb. Any traffic uh, coming in from one side completely prohibits traffic coming in from the other two sides of this T-junction. So we can see that the queue is forming. But once the traffic lights tick over to allow this queue to enter the T-junction, here we go, perfect timing, we can see that the cars choose a particular path, and they follow the rules of the road. The community response to the first video was far greater than I ever anticipated, and as soon as that video went out, I had quite a lot of requests for people to start generating buildings and vehicles and creating all sorts of assets. They'd really latched onto the modifiable properties of the game. And so I thought, well, hang on, let's, let's actually pursue that. After all, this is a community-focused channel, and I want it to be sort of a community project. And people might want to mod this project at different levels of complexity. There'll be those that can't wait to dig into the source code and start poking around, but there'll also be those that are more interested in the creative side of it, so creating the buildings, creating the cars, creating the plot and missions. Uh, so I've decided to extend the engine uh, to be predominantly based in Lua, and we'll see part of that today. 
Now, the approach I'm going to take with this video is a little bit different to my other videos. There's a lot to get through here, so it's not really going to be possible for me to go line by line through all of the code. I will be bringing in large chunks of code and giving it descriptions, but of course all of the source code is available from the GitHub in the link below. And because I've restructured the project quite significantly, I'm going to start building it up from scratch. However, a lot of the ideas we used in part one are going to come over too. So let's get started. The prototype developed in part one of the series was my typical single file approach to developing a quick game. And since there was a great deal of enthusiasm from the community, I thought it better to start to restructure the project in such a way that it can be easily maintained and easily modded. Consequently, I've decided to create a new project, so let's do just that. Here is a blank Visual Studio Windows console application project, and all I've got so far is a main.cpp with a blank int main function. I know now that I'm going to want to split the project across multiple source files, and I'm going to abuse object-oriented programming to help me out, but that means we have to use the pixel game engine in object-oriented programming mode. And because the Pixel Game Engine is a single header solution, this can add additional complexity. The easiest way to use it in multiple files is to create a single CPP file. I'll call it OLC Pixel Game Engine.cpp. And in that file, I'm going to include the header file. This gives the compiler one translatable unit. And this means we can include the OLC pixel game engine.h file from any other file, and we won't have any multiple instances problems. In this same file, I'm also going to include the graphics 3D extension to the pixel game engine. And in fact, we'll do this for any extensions that we load into the project. The idea being that this CPP file gets compiled once by the compiler, and any of the other project files that use these objects will be able to find them. I'm now going to add a class to the project that represents the main game engine. So this is the one that inherits from Pixel Game Engine. I'm going to call it Car Crime City. And to this class, I'm going to add our three familiar functions that we must override on user create called once, on user update called every frame, and on user destroy when the object is shut down. You'll notice that above the include, we're not defining OLC PGE application. That's because we've already done it once in our OLC pixel game engine.cpp file. So the instance of the pixel game engine exists here, but we want the definitions available to multiple files elsewhere, as we have here with the C Car Crime City class. Let me just give a brief overview of the project structure. This isn't necessarily a class diagram, but it's showing how I'm breaking up the project. And to start with, we have our Car Crime City class. This is where the main game is going to be executed. And we're going to configure that class externally in Lua with an object that represents the game settings. Now, this isn't just uh, parameters to describe the resolution, etc. It can also include things like the missions and the story and everything else that we want to externalize. At the moment, the game consists of five primary systems. The first is an object that describes the map and the layout of the city. The second is a system that brings the city to life. This handles the traffic and the pedestrians. The third handles the physics, and we won't look at this in any detail in this video, but this will handle things such as collision responses between the cars, and the handling of the vehicles when the player is driving them. The fourth is the rendering system. This is responsible for drawing things to the screen, and we'll see that the rendering doesn't always happen in just one place. The objects will be responsible for rendering themselves. However, something needs to bind that and bring it all together. The fifth system is broadly labelled artificial intelligence, so this will handle the game mechanics, things such as the police chasing the player, or has the player fulfilled mission objectives. Today, we'll primarily be looking at the top two. As with part one of the video series, the city is divided into cells. But unlike part one, each cell is now a particular type. And so far, I have four cell types. Plane, which represents an open space, but it's drivable. Water is not drivable, but needs to be rendered in a different way. Building cells contain, well, buildings. And all buildings now are OBJ files created externally. We're not generating them based on their height as we did in part one. This allows the game engine to import models created by the community. And finally, roads. And we'll be looking at roads quite a lot today. Automata is also split into three different types. Although, for today, I will be sticking with the base class automata, rather than breaking it up into these three types. 
and that's just to keep the video simple, because right now there's no discernible difference between the three types of automata. But we're going to have one that represents the traffic and the cars, one that represents the pedestrians walking around, and one that represents the police. So to recap, in this video we're going to be looking at the game settings, the main game class, two subsystems controlling the city map and the things that dwell within it, how the cells are structured, and how the four types of cell I have so far are constructed. This project is of a much larger scope than any of those I've tried before on the channel, and as a result I'll be pulling code in rather than talking through it line by line. Now regular viewers of the channel may have noticed that so far this year I've done videos on operator overloading, polymorphism, object collisions and lure embedding, all of which I'm going to use and abuse to great extent in this video. I'm going to start by introducing the game settings, because we need these before we actually do any of the game. It's going to also contain information that defines the screen resolution and how the window appears to the user. And as I did with the Code It Yourself role-playing game, I'm going to create a singleton object that's loaded once with all of this information. I'm going to add a class called Game Settings. And to this class I'm going to add the necessary code to include Lua. This class is going to store information about how to display things to the screen. And it's going to get that information by loading a Lua file and executing it. In the game setting CPP file we've lots of static variables, so I'm going to initialize those to some default values in case the Lua file can't be found. This setup Lua file is not going to be persistent, it's going to be loaded and executed once, and this game settings class will then contain all of the relevant information. So I'm going to create the Lua state. I'm going to attempt to open the file, and then I'm going to attempt to execute the file. If any of these fail, it'll display a message in the console window attached to the game window, which is very useful for debugging. I'm then going to extract the parameters one by one from the Lua file. Once I've got the information I need, I'm going to close the Lua file and return. Now I can go back to my main CPP file and include the Car Crime City class and the Game Settings class. The Game Settings is the first thing I want to load. So I'm going to create an instance of my game setting singleton and call the load config file function, passing to it the particular file path. Once I've loaded the settings, I can then create an instance of the console game engine. And I'll start the console game engine in the way that I usually do, but now I'm going to use the parameters stored in the singleton. I'll call the construct function, and I'll use the properties to configure how the screen looks. So I'm going to specify the width, the height, the pixel width, the pixel height, and finally a mystery bonus parameter which not many people know about, but if you specify a boolean value as a fifth parameter to the construct function, you can force the pixel game engine to use a full screen mode. If it successfully constructs, then start the game. I've added the config lua file to my solution, so I can easily find it and change it. And the nice thing is Visual Studio will syntax highlight the lua correctly. And right now, all I have in my lua file are the parameters that we were looking for. Alongside these mechanical values, I also want the settings class to contain other information about the objects I need to load into the game, such as textures and meshes. This way, they're not hard-coded into the game engine and can be modded externally. For textures, I'm going to create a little struct that contains the name of the texture and the path to the file. And I'm going to create a vector of these structs to store into my singleton. The game engine is going to require a minimal number of textures, one to represent the grass, the roads, the water, some clouds which reflect in the water, the sides of the water, and a smoke decal in this case. These are fixed, so these must exist, though the user can change what they look like. So in Lua, I've created a blank table called textures and populated it with the name and the file path to the PNG file that represents that texture. Reading tables into Lua is not something I covered in the embedding Lua video, but it follows the same set of principles, you just have to remember where you're up to when loading the table. I'm going to look for a global object called textures. That's the table. And I'm just going to make sure that it exists. As with many things in Lua, tables are key and value pairs. So here is the key and here is the value. But what type of value is this? Well, in fact, it's another table. So this description has in fact created a table of tables. Now in my C++ code, I'm not going to explicitly search for a particular key. I just want to load in all of the textures that get defined here, so I could quite happily add more. I'm not interested in the key. 
but I am interested in iterating through the values. And I can do that with the Lua next statement. So I'm going to sit in a loop, asking it to push to the top of the stack the next table. And this is where Lua gets its reputation for being a little bit confusing when embedding in C. What do these indexes mean? Well, I did explain them in the video, but ultimately we found a table at the top of the stack and we've pushed an empty value there. So when we're searching for things, the original table has moved down one. So after this Lua next function, the top of the stack potentially contains our value, which is another table. So I'm going to validate that and in a similar way, get the table and iterate through its values. In this instance, the values are these two strings, grass and the path to the file name. Now the way I've set this up, I'm just asking Lua to return those strings in order. So I'm going to need to count through them to know what they are. Here I'm going to create an object of the texture and a stage counter. And depending on the stage, I know whether it's the name of the texture or the file. Either way, for that particular returned object, I want to pop it off the top of the stack and increase my stage counter. And likewise, with my parent table containing all of the textures, I want to pop the most recent one off the stack and store that texture in my vector of textures. I get that in this brief description, this might seem quite complicated. But to recap, we find the parent table called textures, and then we iterate through that table element by element. The elements themselves happen to be tables, and those tables contain multiple elements through which we iterate and identify which element is which by maintaining a counter. Once we've extracted the relevant information from the table, we can construct our texture object and push it to the vector of textures. The system textures are one type of asset, but we do have another, which is model files, so the OBJ files that represent the buildings and the cars. For these assets, I'm storing who's created them and a description of what it is, a path to the object file and a path to a single texture used to texture that object file. I'm also storing some three-dimensional transformation information on how to rotate it, scale it and translate it. Very quickly after starting this project and people contributing models, I realised that most of the models are going to come back in all sorts of shapes and sizes, not necessarily how I want to use them in the game. So this information allows me to tweak the model externally before importing it into the game without actually needing to change its geometry. And I'm going to store these two types of assets again in vectors, one for buildings and one for vehicles. The Lua file works in a similar way. We can see the name of the creator of that object, what it's called, a path to the object file and a path to its texture, along with uh, nine pieces of information to describe how to transform it. And so far I'm loading two types of buildings and six types of vehicles, all generously donated by the One Loan Coder community. Regardless of whether the asset is a building or a vehicle, I'm going to load it exactly the same way. So I'm going to create a lambda function, not a little one this time, uh, to load the table of tables. And you'll see it follows a similar pattern to how we loaded the texture. There's just more stages this time. I can then call that lambda function to load my buildings and my vehicles and populate the appropriate vectors. Now in a single user configurable Lua file, I can change many properties of the game and what assets are loaded into it. This is great for modding and all of this information is loaded into the game on startup. Note that we've not actually loaded the textures of the objects, we've just loaded the file paths to their location. So now it's up to the Pixel Game Engine to load those resources. So I'll go to our Car Crime City class, and I'm going to add a load assets function, and three standard maps. The maps allow me to associate the name of the asset with an instance of the asset. And I have three different types. One which is a map to hold all of the textures, which are OLC sprites. One which is a map to hold the meshes, which are part of the 3D extension, no different from the Code It Yourself 3D Engine series and what we used in part one. And a third map which stores a matrix that contains that transformation information for the red in objects. So I'm going to give our Car Crime City class access to the 3D graphics extension and the game setting singleton. The Car Crime City class currently doesn't have anything in it, so let's force it to load and create the assets as required. As described in part one of the series, there are some assets which are just going to be fixed, such as a flat unit quad. In this case, I've created the mesh manually, and I'm going to add it to my map of meshes, 
I'm going to label it unit quad and give it the information. There are other bits of fixed geometry too, such as the sides of the water. In this case, it's four walls facing outwards. Again, I'm going to add it to the map and call it walls out. Now I'm going to load the system textures, and these were the ones specified in the Lua file. To do that, I'm going to use an auto for loop to iterate through the vector of texture assets. For each texture asset, I'm going to create a new sprite, and I'm going to load the texture into that sprite. But importantly, I'm also then going to add a pointer to that texture to my map of asset textures, using the name defined in the Lua file. I'll take advantage of this opportunity to inform the user if it can't find the file. In part one, I spent some time describing how we break up the road, because it comes in as a single texture, but it's more convenient to use as multiple textures defining each road pattern. I'm going to do exactly the same here, loading up the road master sprite, and then breaking it up into individual road textures. Here you can see again, I'm naming them and adding them to the map of texture assets. Now I've loaded all of the required textures for the game, I can start to load the buildings. The buildings are going to be self-contained objects, because that's how the community can easily create them and just donate them to the project. I know that in my game settings class, I have a vector of assets that represent the buildings. They contain the object information and the texture information. So I'm going to add to my map of meshes a new mesh given the name of the building. And that mesh can go and get its data by loading the object file associated with that building. We can also load the texture associated with that building. And here we see why naming the assets was a good idea, because it keeps everything together. We'll just have to be careful not to have assets with the same name identified in the Lua file. For each building, we had a mesh, a texture, and a transform. The transform was split up into nine components to represent scale, translation, and rotation in each axis. I'm going to do some heavy-handed matrix math here to take those nine values and construct one final matrix which represents that transform. And again, using the name of the asset, I'm going to store that transform in my map of transforms. And in a rather clumsy but identical way, I'm going to do exactly the same for vehicle objects. I did warn you this was going to go quickly. Let's have a look at the structure of a cell object. From the first video, you may remember that cells contain very little information, just the X position in the world, the Y position in the world, and whether they were solid or not. We'll use the solid boolean to construct collision geometry later on. Now I'm going to give the cells a lot more responsibility, and as I identified earlier, we're going to derive subtypes of cell from some cell base class. And I'm going to exploit polymorphism to do that. But I also want some rough reflection capability of the cell object, so it can tell what type it is. We can interrogate the cell and work out is it a road or is it a building quite easily. So I'm also going to throw in a type of cell information. But what other responsibilities are we going to give the cells? Well, firstly, they're going to be responsible for drawing themselves, and they're going to have three types of drawing. So we're going to have a function called draw base, and that's responsible for drawing the contents of the cell. For reasons that will become apparent later in the series, I'm also going to have a draw alpha. It's important that we draw transparent objects after we've drawn the base objects. And because this is a big project and it's going to get complicated very quickly, I'm going to have a third drawing layer called Draw Debug, which will allow me to visualise information about the state of the cell. As we saw when we were constructing the road networks, the neighbourhood of the cell is quite important to determine what the cell looks like and how it behaves. So I'm also going to include a Calculate Adjacency function, which allows the cell to adjust itself based on its neighbourhood. And finally, the cell may contain assets, such as buildings and other objects. So it needs a way to access the maps of the assets that we've loaded. So I'm going to create a final function called link assets. And the cell itself will decide what assets it's interested in using by using the names of the assets that we've specified. So let's add a base class called cell. Since the cell is going to be responsible for drawing itself, I'm going to give it access to the game engine and the graphics 3D extension. And I identified that the cell is going to need some way of knowing what type of cell it is. 
So I'll create an enumeration of various types of cell. In the cell, we're going to give it the basic properties so it can identify where it is in the world and whether it's solid or not. And because this is a base class, I'm going to define six virtual methods to be overridden by the subclasses. The three drawing functions will take in references to the Pixel Game Engine and the current 3D rendering pipeline. I've included an additional update method to the cell, just in case it has behavior that changes over time. And here with the link assets function, we can see we're just passing references to the maps of the assets we created earlier for textures, meshes, and transforms. A cell on its own is meaningless. It needs to belong to a collection of cells, which fortunately for us defines the city. So I'm going to create another class that actually defines our city. I'm going to call it C city map. And it's important that the cell knows which map it belongs to. So I'm going to create a, a second constructor, which is going to take a pointer to the city map and its location within that map. And I'll forward declare city map because the city map is going to contain cells which contain pointers to the city map. So we've got a bit of a circular reference going on. And I want the pointer to the city map to be accessible to derived objects of this class because otherwise we won't be able to calculate the adjacency. The cell exists in isolation, but when it wants to check its neighbors, it's going to have to look at the map and then calculate what its neighbors are and get access to them. The city map is really nothing more than an array of cells, the dimensions of which are specified by the constructor. So I've changed the constructor to pass in the width and the height, but I'm also going to pass in the maps to our assets. And it's going to need access to these maps because it's going to construct a default city, which means it needs to construct all of the cells and the cells need access to these maps in order to draw themselves and behave appropriately. And I'm going to add some rather mundane functions such as saving and loading cities, getting the width and the height, getting a specific cell and replacing a specific cell. I'm not going to go into detail on how those operate. But fundamentally, we maintain the array of P cells here. And I'll add two more methods to create the city, which is really a mirror of the constructor and destroy the city to free up all of the memory that we've allocated. In the city map CPP file, for now our constructor is just going to call the create city function. By default, we're going to create a city that contains of nothing but grass. And when the destructor is called, it's going to call our release city function. I'll add in the more boring things, such as getting the width and the height, and getting a specific cell. If the cell is out of bounds, it's going to return null pointer. Otherwise, it returns a pointer to the cell that exists in the array. The replace function deletes the existing cell and replaces it with the new one. So let's just run through the create city function. If a city already exists, it's going to release it. If not, it creates an array of pointers to cells. And then using a nested pair of for loops, I'm going to iterate through all of the cells and create them. By default, they're all going to be of type cell plane, which we've not implemented yet, but it's just going to be a grassy square. But as I create each cell, I need to give it access to the assets that it's going to use. So every time I create a new cell, I'm going to call the link assets function and use the maps to the assets that we've created earlier. I've gone on to add the release city and I'm not bothering with saving or loading cities just yet. But here we can see there is an error to C cell plane and that's because we've not created a derived cell type called plane. So let's do that. Let's add a new class, cell plane, and it's going to inherit from the base class, just C cell. Since this class does inherit from C cell, I'm going to implement the functions I want to override, which in this case is link assets, updating, and a couple of the drawing functions. And it's taken a long time getting here, but now we can see why linking the assets is a good idea. This cell plane requires a certain set of assets in order to draw itself appropriately. It requires access to the unit quad, and it requires access to uh, the grass texture or the pavement texture. And you'll see that these are just pointers. So we only ever have one instance of that particular asset, but we're going to reuse it in multiple cells. In my implementation of the plane cell, the cell can either be a grass type or an asphalt type, which I'm going to specify with a little enumeration. And I'm going to override the default constructor with this custom one that links it to the map, its position in the world, and what type of plane it's going to be. In the constructor for the plane, you can see that we actually call the base cell constructor with this information. 
we've just tagged on a little bit of extra information for this specific plane type. The first function to override was link assets. And this is where we can see that mapping was quite useful because if I want to draw this as a grass plane or an asphalt plane, I can just choose the relevant texture. So in this case, I'm storing pointers to both types and deciding when I'm drawing it, which one to use. I'm also storing a pointer to the unit quad mesh. And so the cell can extract the information it needs quite trivially for the programmer. For now, update isn't going to do anything, but we're going to draw the cell based on its type. So this is the draw base function, which we're overriding. We construct a transformation matrix to translate it to the right place in world space. And we take in the pipeline from the 3D extension and set that transform to it. We then choose which texture to apply to the quad and we tell the pipeline to render that unit quad. This is all exactly the same as the first video and other 3D bits and pieces I've done since then. For now, there is no alpha component, so the function's not going to do anything. Phew, now we've got structures that represent a particular type of cell and the overall city, we can go back to the core game part now and render something. In OnUser Create, I'm going to load our assets. And I'm going to create a blank default city called pCity using the settings pulled in from the Lua file. I'm now going to pull in various parts from video one, which we use to edit the city. I'll speed through this though. Right, so briefly, what I've done is added the mouse selection feature uh, here with a function called get mouse on ground. And in on user update, depending on whether the tab key has been pressed, we're in edit mode or not. If we're in edit mode, then the uh, mouse selection code is executed so we can work out where the mouse cursor is and apply the appropriate edits to the terrain. One of the slight differences I've added, if you've ever looked at my panning and zooming video, I've added that functionality now that I've got the mouse wheel. So I can hold down the mouse wheel to move the scene around and zoom in and out by scrolling it. In much the same way in the previous video, I work out what the visible extent of the universe is, uh, and I update the cells for that visible extent, and then I start to render the scene. I create a rendering pipeline, uh, and one little new feature I've added to the 3D graphics engine, which I will go into a few more videos about in detail, uh, which is the lighting engine that's been added to that. So now you can add in several light sources as well. And then I start to render the objects. Remember, I have three different types of rendering call for an object, so I scroll through the visible objects and render the base, passing along references to the pixel game engine and the pipeline used for the 3D rendering. Uh, then I render objects that may contain some alpha components because they need to be drawn on top of existing objects. And if we're in edit mode exclusively, I'm also going to call the draw debug function for the cell. So these are all four loops doing exactly the same thing. And again, if we're in edit mode, remember we could select multiple cells and draw them. This is exactly the same as it was in video part one, except this time I'm drawing the unit quad from our map of asset meshes as a wireframe. And so for the first time in this video, let's take a look. And as before, we can see a blue background with a green plane in the bottom quadrant, uh, but I can use the mouse now to zoom in and out. I can zoom right into the texture and I can use the middle mouse to sort of pick up and scroll the world around. I can select cells at different zoom levels. And right click to unselect. One thing to note is let's test our Lua framework. Clearly it's loaded the correct grass texture, but let's see if the other parameters have also come through. So the first thing I'm going to change in our Lua file is just the size of the pixel. Before it was two by two screen pixels. Now I can run this, you'll see there's no compilation, but yes, it has changed the pixel game engine. Excellent, that means our Lua file settings are being loaded. We've only got the one type of cell at the moment and that is plain, so let's add buildings. And I'm not going to subject you to a line by line on this, but here is the cell building class uh, and it's going to store locally its name, uh, a link to its texture, a link to its mesh and a link to its transform. Now, because this cell building class may have lots of different types of building, 
we use the name parameter to identify which particular one this needs to link to, and we can extract the relevant resources from our maps of assets. Drawing the building is very simple. As usual, we create a translation matrix to offset it to the correct location in the world, and we multiply that translation matrix by the building's transform matrix. This is the one created from the parameters in the Lua file. We then apply that combined transformation to the rendering pipeline, and, and if it has a texture or not, uh, we decide on the appropriate rendering method. And that's it. We're going to assume for now that buildings don't have alpha components. Buildings were very simple, so let's add another one, which is water. So this is cells that are going to contain water. Now, water is rendered slightly differently because I want it to reflect the clouds uh, on top of a water texture. And we'll take a quick look at how that's done, but you can see it takes local links to the resources that it's going to need. And water is also going to override the calculate adjacency function. And that's quite important because we want to render the water cell depending on whether its neighbours are water too. So in the link assets function, it's going to be a unit quad to render the actual layer of water. And we're going to use our mesh of walls to independently draw north, south, east and west walls for the water. Don't forget the water sits below the ground plane. So it has some walls there to keep the water in. But we only want to draw the walls if the neighbours are not water. And so that's exactly what we do in our calculate adjacency function. This is called once when the whole map has been changed because there's no point in calling uh, adjacency calculations as we're placing the items. You need to do it on a map-wide basis. And what we do is very simple. We take this current cell's location in the world and we look at its immediate neighbours. If those neighbours are of the type cell water, then we populate this array of booleans to say, yes, my neighbours are water. When it comes to drawing the water, we take our usual translation matrix and we set up the pipeline, but then we draw the four walls individually depending on the state of the neighbours. So we've got this information from our calculate adjacency function, which allows us then to render the appropriate scenery. But water does involve drawing in the alpha phase because these are the walls of the water and the water level itself sits halfway up the walls and it's transparent so we can see a little bit of the wall beneath the water. I won't detail this, but I will highlight it just so you can go and have a look at it yourself. Some of you may not be familiar with the Pixel Game Engine, but it does have the ability to implement pixel shading. You can specify your own shader as to how it blends textures together. And in this instance, it's blending a water texture with a cloud texture, but the cloud texture remains in screen space, so it looks more static than the water texture. Now that we have additional cell types, we need to be able to place them in the world. And this is done in the do edit mode function. So remember, the tab key will enable edit mode, allowing us to change the world. The code at the start of this function is just to handle multiple selected objects or not, and was discussed in the first video. If anything changes the map in a significant way, we need to run through all of the cells in the map and call the calculate adjacency function so they can all update themselves depending on their neighbours. And so given a set of selected cells, the user can press a key to determine what those cells become. In this case, if they press G, we go through all of the cells in the selected cell set and replace them with grass cells, remembering to link the assets to the new cell. We flag that the map has changed because we may need to get the cells to update themselves based on their neighbours. We have two types of plain cell, one is grass and one is asphalt. So if the user presses the P key, we'll change it into, well, pavement in this case. And if the user presses the W key, we'll do the same for water. For now, I'm going to assume one building type, and I'm going to put a building there based on whether the Q key has been pressed. And you'll see each time we're using polymorphism just to override the cell that exists, but in this case, we're sending the name of the particular building model into our building class constructor. And it's this name which will be used to link the assets for that particular cell. Specifically, this name comes from the Lua file that we specified at the start. But right now, for this video, I've hard-coded it in here. The intention is to have a drop-down menu that allows you to select a particular building type and use the name of that building to link all of this together. So let's take a look and see if this is working. So I've got my map of empty grass so I can select some cells, select them randomly, and change them to pavement. Very nice. Now, what was the other type that we've got? We've got uh, water. So again, some random cells. Now, water required adjacency information to draw the walls. And we can see it's only now drawing the walls where it needs to put them. 
and there's some transparency happening, so it's drawing the wall first and then drawing a layer of water on top. And you might not be able to make it out in the YouTube video, but there's a static image of some clouds in the background to give the appearance of some kind of reflection. Maybe I need to balance that a little bit more. It looks a little bit like the uh, map is floating about in the sky. Anyway, finally, we can try buildings, which was the Q key. And so this is a building object created by a member of the One Loan Code Discord server. It's an object file that's loaded up with the appropriate textures. And even though we've got multiple buildings, they're all linking to the one instance of the asset, so we're not wasting resources needlessly. The final cell type is, of course, the road. And we've got a bunch of different road types for this cell, depending on what junction or corner it represents. And it works in a very similar way to the water. It needs to know what its neighbours are, so during the calculate adjacency function, it can choose the appropriate texture for its unit quad. In the previous videos, the road choice was selected during the rendering stage, and this is perhaps a little bit not the best way to do it, so instead we're doing it at the edit stage. And those familiar with video 1 will immediately recognise how we're calculating what type of junction should be displayed for a given road cell. At the link assets phase, we're just choosing the appropriate texture and creating a link to that particular sprite. And drawing the road cell is even simpler, we calculate its position in world space, give it the appropriate texture, and simply draw it to the screen. In the main car crime city class in the edit function, we're going to respond to the R key being pressed, which just replaces the selected cell with a road cell type. We indicate that the map has changed, so it goes through and then calculates the adjacency for all of the new cells. So let's just see that in action. I'll just zoom out a little bit, and we'll draw a test pattern that will choose all of the road sections which is a 5x5 five five grid, so we get all the T-junctions, all the corners, vertical, horizontal, and a crossroad. Now press the R key, and it's selected the roads, and you can see I've updated the texture for the roads now. Very nice. Let's just throw a few buildings in here. I'll probably add a way to rotate the buildings. Let's add some water and some pavements. Right, so we've spent the first part of this video essentially recreating what I made in part one of the series, but this time around it's far more modular and easy to extend. For the next part of this video I'm going to look at adding life to the city, and this is going to get a little bit complicated because we're going to use multiple layers of transportation grids. And I'm going to start by issuing a big warning. There's a lot more code to this than I can sensibly show in the remainder of this video, but I will talk through the main points of the algorithm. And of course, the code is available for you to look at from the GitHub linked in the description below. There is a lot going on regarding transportation in this city, and it fundamentally involves the ownership of pointers to objects. As has been well established by now, we know that the city is a grid of cells. And a subset of those cells, specifically roads, need to contain information for things to move around on them. Here I've constructed a small section of road network, and we can see it divided into several pieces. These two shaded in tiles are not road sections, but everything else is. The blue line indicates the boundary of the pavement, that's where our pedestrians are going to walk. The green line represents the road markings, so we've got two lanes on all of our roads. I'm going to assume that anything that moves around is going to stay on a track that follows the profile of the road. I'm going to assume that all the things that move around are going to follow a track like a railway, so cars and pedestrians will follow a particular path around each road section. So for this corner section, we've got a piece of track that behaves like this, and a piece of track that behaves like this. That's to handle the cars. We also have additional track to handle the pedestrians, and a small one in this corner. So far for this corner, we've got eight pieces of track, because I'm going to define a track as being a straight line between nodes. And so what we see here, for this pedestrian, we have a node here, and a node here for the road, a node here for the other lane, and a node for the pedestrian in that corner. But I'm also going to have a node at the cell boundaries. Straight sections of road are a bit simpler. They have a single piece of track linking one edge to the other. 
T-junctions offer several possibilities for the cars and the pedestrians. Firstly, we can see that traffic coming in on this lane can go straight across, or it can turn right. Traffic coming from the bottom can immediately turn left, or it can join to the path at the top. And traffic coming in from the right can either turn right or go straight across. So when I place some nodes into here, we can see we get a fairly regularly spaced set of nodes to represent just the cars. Pedestrians also have several options. I'm going to draw them in orange this time just so it's a bit clearer. They can go straight across or they can choose to cross at this junction. Now we know in these little corner pieces we have several path options available there. They can go straight across again to several here and down. So I can draw in the nodes for the pedestrians. In this instance, you can see that I'm not linking the pedestrian tracks to the car tracks. And this makes sense, because I don't want the pedestrians to follow the car paths. We can make an assumption that the worst case scenario for tracks and nodes is a crossroads, which I've drawn here. These corner sections are the little bits of pavement that eat into the crossroads section. Starting with the traffic, we know we're going to need nodes on the boundaries of the cells and we're going to need nodes to allow them to turn from any direction to other directions. So I'll draw in the tracks between the nodes for traffic. Pedestrians too also come in from the boundaries, but they also have the opportunity to cross the roads, which they do at the level crossing. So even though we're using the same node and track structure, we can formulate it in such a way that the two don't interfere with each other. So we've got one system for the automata known as cars, another system for the automata known as pedestrians. If you remember in the project structure, we had a third one, which was for cops. And cops are going to cheat because they're not going to drive on a particular lane. To keep the implementation of this reasonably simple, I don't want to have the policemen trying to avoid all of the local traffic. So to give them a fighting chance, they're going to drive along the middle of the road sections. So this implies we've got a third transportation network, which is much simpler, which is for the police. But it's also going to be used for the navigation aids within the game, so things like GPS and, and follow the path, that sort of thing. We can use this very simple network to handle uh, navigation, perhaps using a star or a flow-like algorithm from one place in the city to another. Tracks between nodes don't have any information about what direction the object that is on that track should travel in. So when an object is placed on a track, let's place one here, it keeps a track of which node it started at and will always travel towards the other node of the track. This means that all track sections are bidirectional. When the object reaches the end node for a particular track section, it can choose to travel along any of the other connected tracks, but it cannot choose the track it's just come in on. So naively, it could choose to go up, right, or down in this instance. However, just giving it free reign like this would be catastrophic, because cars would be coming in, and they would be circling around here and moving up, up different roads they shouldn't be going up. Generally, they'll be breaking the rules of the road. So we need some additional information to make sure that they don't break these rules. Since I'm British and I drive on the left of the road, if I have come in from this side of the junction, the only options available to me are to immediately turn left or to keep going straight on. If I wanted to do a U-turn, I could turn downwards, but I'm not. That's going to be breaking the rules. So I need something to tell me that this particular route is invalid. Likewise, let's say I have now travelled to this particular node. I can't turn left, so that route is invalid. I can go straight on, or I can turn right. Well, let's suppose I chose to turn right. At this node, the only option available to me is to continue going down. I don't want to turn into the opposing lane of traffic, so that is an invalid option. Setting whether or not a node can be passed through is very important to making sure that all of this works. We can think of them as being quite detailed traffic lights. Now I've made a simplifying assumption that at a particular junction traffic will only enter from one direction at a time. So if my traffic is coming in from this particular node as we've just demonstrated, 
traffic should be stopped at all other entry points, giving that particular object a clear path through the junction. Whether or not the object chooses to go left or right at a particular node, I'm just going to leave to chance. It'll break things up a little bit. We could perhaps statistically bias things if we wanted to have some more advanced control of the traffic management, but right now I'm just going to let it choose as it gets to each node, because it cannot break the rules of the road. The same patterns can be applied to the other transport networks too. So for example, if we've got traffic coming in from the left, we don't want pedestrians up here being able to cross the road. So one way to do that is to put an additional node here, which will set to stop. So the pedestrians can quite happily walk around the corner, but whilst there's traffic flowing, they can't cross the streets. The police node in the middle and on the end sections are never going to be stopped because the police can break the rules. So for each cell, we're going to assemble a network topology consisting of nodes and tracks between the nodes. And we're also going to assemble a sequence of node pass-throughs or don't pass-throughs. I'm going to call those stop maps. We can see for one cell here, we've got quite a lot of nodes. We can make life easier for ourselves by placing more nodes, but just never using them. It would be far more convenient to have a regular rectangle of nodes to choose from. And so here with all of the nodes, even though they're not quite evenly spaced out, what we see is we've got a seven by seven grid of potential places to have a node. In my implementation, I'm not going to give the cell ownership of the nodes. I'm going to create a large array of nodes that belong to the city map. And the reason I'm doing this is because we can see here that adjacent cells share a node boundary. And so if this cell is accessing this node and this cell is accessing this node, it is indeed the same node. Therefore, I'm going to store the nodes in the cells as pointers to nodes stored in the city map. So we can start to form two basic data structures. We've got a node which has a position in world space. It also has a flag to indicate whether or not it is blocking. We also have a track. And a track contains two pointers, one to the node at one end, and the other is a pointer to the node at the other end. Tracks are going to be owned by the cell within which they reside. So I'm also going to store a pointer to the C cell object. Finally, any object moving around on the network is associated with a particular section of track. And there can be multiple objects on a piece of track. So a track is also going to maintain a list to pointers of the automata. Using a list also infers some sort of order to the automata on that track section because we can treat a list like a first in, first out data structure. So we may have a node at the start with the track section joining it, the node at the end. As objects are assigned to this piece of track, they travel along and subsequent objects can be added and they remain in the order of which we added them to the track. And this is quite useful for handling traffic. Now I mentioned before that when we get to the end of a piece of track, we need to select a new node for the automata to target. This means we also need to know what tracks are associated with which nodes. So in my node structure, I'm going to maintain a list of pointers to tracks. And so given a node, that list simply contains references to all of the tracks that have it as part of its start or end. One final property I'll add to the track is the length of the track. And this will just simply be calculated using uh, the distance between its start node and its end node. And this is really a cache, so I don't have to calculate that distance every frame. Now, the one thing I've not actually talked about yet is the automata and we'll get to that in due course. I'm going to add a class to the project, C Automata, which is going to contain most of the mechanics for this system. 
creates a very simple class for the node. It has a constructor that takes in a position, and you'll see that I'm using the VF2D type from the Pixel Game Engine now. So this is going to make all of the node position manipulation much simpler because we've got operator overloading enabled for this. All this node stores is, as we described, the position, a flag to say whether it can block, and a list of pointers to the tracks that are attached to this node. The other object is, of course, the track. And we can see we've got two nodes, which is the starting and the ending point. A pointer to the cell that owns this track, the track length, and a list to the automata which are travelling along this track. You'll notice there's also a get position function here. We'll come to that in a minute. Now you might be thinking, why should the cell own the track? Well, it's a little bit of an optimization. There's no point in updating the automata for cells that are far away from where the viewer currently is. And so, as I can isolate which cells are currently visible on screen, and I can identify which cells are within a given radius away from the player, I then have direct access to the tracks that I need to update. This means I don't have to search on a track-by-track -track basis to see if they are within that particular boundary of update. I've already done that, calculating it coarsely for the cells. Here is a placeholder for the automata. So this is the, the base class for Automata, and I'll be using just the base class today. And we can see that really all it contains is which track it is currently on, and the node through which it entered that track section. And because we have this node, that means we can work out the exit node. So the body can work out which direction it needs to travel along the track. Cells and Automata go hand in hand. So I'm going to include the Automata header file in my cell class and cells contain pointers to navigation nodes. In this case, 49 of them, because there are seven by seven nodes per cell. The cell doesn't own the nodes, but it does own the tracks. And as you can see, these are not pointers to tracks, this is where the tracks will physically reside. The navigation nodes are actually owned by CCityMap. So I've just added that variable to the class, and we're going to use that to allocate an array for all of the nodes in the city, which means we need to modify our createCity function to now populate that node array. Firstly, we need to create that array of nodes. Well, we've got 49 per cell, and we've got n height by n width cells. All I need to do per node is give it a world space position. So I'm going to iterate through all of the cells in my map, and knowing the cell position, I can create an offset into my array of nodes. I then want to iterate through the nodes, 7 in the x direction and 7 in the y direction, using nested for loops, to give them an appropriate position. Now, I've determined that these positions along the x-axis are suitable for the nodes. So one's on the extreme left and one's on the extreme right, and one's in the middle. These two represent the car lanes, and these two represent the pedestrians. Once I've calculated it for x, I do exactly the same for y. And then I set the position of the node, knowing that the cell location in world space plus the offset that I've just calculated will give me that node's position in world space. By default, I'm going to let all of the nodes pass all of the traffic by setting the blocking parameter to false. Being able to get to the position in my P nodes array quickly from any given cell seems like quite a useful thing to do. So I'm going to add an additional function to my city map class, which just returns specifically the address of the node at the top left corner of my cell. This means that given a specific cell coordinate, x and y, I can get the address of the node in this top corner. From there, I can easily access my array of contiguous nodes to get the specific node that I need. The cell contains an array of pointers to the nodes stored in the map. So now I'm going to link those pointers to those cells. I'll do it first coarsely by doing a one-to-one -one relationship between the cell's navigation node pointer and the map's node in world space. But now I want to deal with the edge cases. Here I've got two cells uh, shown as index locations into the corresponding nodes. Right now, you could visualize these as pointers and underneath them is the node itself but I want to share boundary nodes. So when I'm processing a particular cell, given that these are pointers, I really want this particular pointer to point to this location, all the way down that edge. The node that was here is still there, but nothing points to it. 
So it's using up a bit of memory, but it's never actually used in the game. We're going to share the node at this edge of the adjacent cell. The relationship between these two sets of indices is quite trivial. And if I'm going through it using a for loop, just to set the nodes down this side, one, two, three, four, five, and six, what we can see is that the target array index is equal to my for loop index multiplied by seven plus six. Zero becomes six, one becomes 13, two becomes 20, three becomes 27, etc. So I can easily and algorithmically access the correct nodes on the left hand side of my cell so I can share them. In a similar fashion, I'm going to share the southern edge of my adjacent cell. So this pointer gets linked up here, this one gets linked up here, etc, etc. So the northern and western edges of a cell are shared, and you may be thinking, well hang on, what about this particular one? It's shared in two different places. Well, it, it's not. It doesn't actually matter, because none of our transportation networks are ever going to access that node. And if you need to quickly visualize why, let me draw the crossroads again over here, although it'll be spatially distorted now. So the pedestrian track doesn't touch the extreme corner nodes. Here we've got our police and navigation track, and here we've got our road network. So that node never gets used, that node never gets used, that one, and that one. So they can be whatever they like. In fact, there are a bunch of nodes on here that never get used. And so I'll cross those out too. These nodes, even though they don't look like they're used, don't forget they're used to handle pedestrians crossing the road. So once I've set up all of the nodes to the default values, I'm now going to perform the linkage along the southern and northern edges. If the cell's Y position happens to be along the top edge of the map, I'm not going to link them to anything. I'm just going to set it to null pointer. And here I'll link the western side. That's using the formula I've just shown on the slides. And we can also look at the southern and eastern sides for the same reasons, that if they're on the boundaries of the whole map, we don't want them to connect to anything. Finally, there's a bunch of nodes which we don't use, which we've just scrubbed out. I'm going to just force those to be unused explicitly by casting them to null pointer. So this setup has prepared a cell with just pointers to valid nodes which exist in world space, and that nodes on cell boundaries are shared together. Nodes that are simply unused are ignored. For a given cell, it's useful to visualize the nodes just to see what's happening. So in the debug information override for the cell road, I'm just going to iterate through all 49 links to the nodes, calculate their position, and choose the color to be red or green based on whether they're blocking or not. I'm using a special function in the 3D engine called render circle XZ, which renders a 2D circle on the XZ plane at a given XY location. So let's take a quick look. Uh, let's just quickly draw out some road. Don't have to be too precise with it. Uh, press the R key to turn it into road, and we can see green dots appearing at the node locations that we've specified, where there is a node. Uh, nodes that were set to null pointer don't get drawn, so these are the only nodes we're interested in in linking tracks between. Currently, by default, all of the nodes are set to be non-blocking, so they're all a vibrant green colour. I can disable the debug overlay by pressing the tab button. Now it's time to add the tracks, and we'll do this in the calculate adjacency function. I'm doing it here simply because I know what road junction type it is after this function has been calculated. And I need to know what road junction type it is in order to choose the appropriate tracks linking the nodes. So before I do anything, I'm going to clear any tracks that belong to this particular cell. And I've created an auto uh, lambda function to create the track for me, providing that the nodes are valid. So it simply takes the two node indices, which in this case will be the 0 to 48, which we just saw in the previous slide, and creates a track and returns a pointer to it for me. So here we can see it creating the track, uh, setting up the two nodes, calculating the length using the uh, Vector2D library, and then it pushes the track back to the cells list of tracks. It also updates the nodes with a pointer to the track that's just been created, because remember the nodes maintain a list of the tracks they're attached to. And now it's time to start adding data. And this can get very boring and very complicated. If all of this so far isn't enough to make you stop wanting to be a programmer, the next section probably will definitely do that. Uh, it's data entry time, because we've got lots of junction types and lots of different 
track configurations to do, we just have to go through it. And it takes quite a bit of time, it's tremendously dull, and you might want to fast forward this bit, although I've sped it up anyway. Let's start with the most simple one. I'm calling it the chase track. It's the one the police use and we're going to use for navigation. So Horizontal Road has a single track going across the middle from nodes 21 to 27. Let me just identify where they are. Node 21 to 27. Straight across the middle, horizontal road section. Likewise for a vertical road section, it's straight down the middle, but vertically. And we can follow that through for all of the other types of road. So the corners, they have two track sections, T-junctions have three track sections, and the crossroads have four track sections. To make sure that I'm adding the tracks correctly, I'm going to add to the debug drawing layer of the cell the ability to visualise the tracks. So I'm just going to iterate automatically through the list of tracks that belong to this cell and draw a line between them. Again, this is another little hidden function in the 3D engine that will draw a 2D line in 3D space. So we can check this out for the chase track. Draw a bit of road, make sure we've got a junction in there. And the chase track is shown as this blue line. Uh, the T-junction we can see it's a very simple track that just follows the middle of the road. That'll be perfect for navigation. In exactly the same way, I'm now going to add the tracks for the pedestrian network. Uh, for now, please excuse this variable p-safe pedestrian track. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but it's working exactly the same way. I'm just adding the tracks to the nodes. And finally, we'll also add the road traffic. And this is the most complicated one because there's lots of track sections. But it works in exactly the same way. So let's just take a look and see how that all renders. And that's looking okay. We can see the pedestrians going across the crossings and the pavements. And we can see in this T-junction there is a restriction on where the traffic can flow through the junction. It is looking okay. I'll just add in a crossroads just to make sure. Yep, and the crossroads seems to have all possible permutations. We want to programmatically control whether or not the nodes are blocking. And so I'm going to use the concept of a stop pattern, a small struct here that contains 49 booleans, one for each node. And for a particular road cell, I'm going to maintain a vector of stop patterns, and also a counter which tells me which stop pattern I'm currently at. And in the update function for this cell, I'm going to accumulate time, and when time hits a certain threshold, change to the next stop pattern. So tucked away in here, in our cell road class, we've got the update function. Let's just fill that in. Firstly, we'll check, is our vector of stop patterns empty? Uh, if it is, then we've nothing to do, just return false. Otherwise, accumulate f elapsed time. We're getting back into the game world here. If five seconds have elapsed, then I want to go to the next pattern in my pattern vector. And I want it to wrap round. So I'm taking the modulus here just to make sure that once I've gone through all of the patterns, I get back to the start. When there is a pattern change, I simply go through all of the uh, stop conditions in my stop pattern and set the corresponding node's blocking boolean to the same value in the location in my stop pattern. So for this cell, every five seconds, the pattern of nodes which are blocking will change. Now we just need to fill in those patterns. I'll do this after we've added the tracks. Now this could get very confusing very quickly, so I want a more visual way to program this than just specifying numbers directly. I want something that looks like this. So here I've got a 7x7 seven seven grid, which shows all of the relevant nodes, excluding those for the chase track, because I never want to put a stop on the chase track. So here we can see nodes marked as P are dedicated on the pedestrian pathways, and those marked as O are on the traffic pathways. What I intend to do, for example, to stop all of the traffic, wherever there is an X, that node becomes blocked. Nothing can pass through it. And I quite like being able to draw the stop pattern visually like this. I think it'll be easier to work with. So I'm going to create a little auto lambda function which takes in a string that is that pattern and fills up a stop pattern structure appropriately. Now the nice thing is we don't need to do stop patterns for every possible road type. In fact, all of those don't do anything at all. They're just passive road sections. There's no scope for traffic control. But let's just consider the worst case scenario to begin with, the crossroad. The first thing I want to do in my sequence is allow pedestrians to cross. So you can see here I've got X's on all of the road network. No cars will be able to travel through this junction, but I've allowed pedestrians 
to cross the roads. Now it's important that once a pedestrian has started walking across the road that we don't change the stop pattern and it gets stuck. So for every stop pattern we need an equivalent drain pattern. So here the traffic is still stopped but X's have replaced where the pedestrians could cross the road. That allows the pedestrians to actually cross the road before the cars start moving. So the next stop pattern is allowing the traffic to come in from the west side. So this is the example that we drew before on the slides. The traffic's going to come in here and we can see if it's coming in this way it can go straight across or it can go turning left or it can turn right. All other options are blocked so the wrong track can't be chosen. And just as we did with the pedestrians we need an ability to drain the traffic from this junction before we allow traffic to carry on moving. So I keep all of the exit routes open just as we did before those three, but I stop traffic entering the junction from that side. And I'm going to do this for all junction types and all traffic flow types. And as you can see, it's quite a tedious exercise. If you recall, in our Car Crime City main game class, we actually have a facility for updating the cells. Here I've drawn out a section of road, and we can see now which nodes are blocked and which ones aren't. And they should change every five seconds or so. There we go, they all just change then. If I focus on a particular junction, so in this case, we can see that all traffic has been stopped, but the pedestrian nodes, or the pedestrian nodes now have just been closed off, so the pedestrians are draining out. And now traffic has opened to cross the road from left to right or left turning upwards, and now that's been closed off so it can drain out and it moves on to the next junction round. So we've got a controlled sequence of traffic flow. Yeah, it's becoming a long one this, isn't it? Uh, but we're on to the final section now. We're going to add some automata into our city to follow these particular tracks and nodes. Right, so let's look at automata. This blue rectangle represents a car on a track, and the specific location of the car happens to be at the front here. The car has come in through this node, so it knows that that's its origin node. Which means, combined with knowing which track it's on, it can work out where its target node is. So, it knows it needs to move in this direction. Each frame, we assess if the car can move, it should move a little bit proportional to F elapsed time along this track. There might be other parameters such as its speed, etc, but we'll just assume it nudges along the track fairly linearly right now. For a given section of track, we can work out the position quite easily. All we need to know is what the starting node was, and the distance along the track currently travelled. Now, this isn't normalised distance, this isn't between 0 and 1, this is a real value reflecting how far in distance terms have we travelled along the track. And so if we know that node 0 was our starting node, we calculate the distance along the track one way, and if it wasn't, we calculate the distance along the track the other. So actually extracting the position of an automata in world space is quite simple. But the automata need to follow some rules. We know that several automata can exist on a given section of track. So we need to establish what will allow the automata to move forward. Well, in this situation, we can see that there's already a car in front. And so if there is a car in front, we don't want to crash into the back of it. So we need to make sure that there is sufficient distance between the two automata central points. And if there is sufficient distance, then this one can move. If there isn't, it can't. It's got to stop. And we can use this distance d as a parameter in a speed function for the automata behind it. And this is quite nice because visually we can slow down the automata proportional to that distance. So it looks like the cars are braking, and indeed accelerating. Now let's assume a slightly different scenario. The automata in front is on now a different track section, but because the car has length, the automata behind it may not be able to move forwards. And we may have a car moving that way, and we may have a car moving this way. So the car in question needs to check the tracks from its target node. Do any of the automata on those tracks overlap with the track that it's currently on? 
If it does, in a similar way, we can work out the distance to the closest object and use that in our decision as to whether the car can move or not. The third behaviour is a little different. The automata has now reached its end node. It needs to make a decision. Firstly, it will check the end node's block value to see can it move past it. If this is set to true, then the automata simply cannot move. The way is shut. If it can move, it's got to choose another track to join onto. Well, we know explicitly it can't join the track it's just come in on. So it has a choice of the three other tracks to choose. My approach to this is it just randomly chooses one of these tracks and then checks to see if the end location of the new track is blocked or not. In this case, this path is closed. So it's not going to choose this path. That means it has to choose to turn left or carry on straight. Once we've established that the automata can move and it's chosen a track to join, we need to disconnect it from the track that it's currently on and connect it to the new track, remembering to set the origin node for the automata. Now, in the introduction video, my automata are just being drawn as circles. They don't have this rectangular length, but I'm including that in the code so that they space themselves apart. We're assuming that the automata has a length. But you might also be thinking, well hang on, if everything's turning 90 degrees, it's going to look rubbish. Cars don't turn 90 degrees on the spot. And we'll cover that in the next part of the series. But if your automata is a rectangle being dragged by the front, as the rectangle makes that 90 degree turn, the rectangle itself, if it follows the properties of a car, will actually turn in a reasonably realistic way. But that's definitely for the next video. Currently, automata are not owned by anything. Uh, they will be owned by the main game engine, so they need their own update function in order to follow the paths. This function is quite complex, but I'll run through it. The first thing to do is work out which is your exit node and which is your origin node. That way you can work out the directionality that the object needs to follow along the track. I'm going to add two variables. One is a boolean that says the automata can move, and the other is a distance to the car in front. I'm just setting that to one for now. The automata are stored in a linked list, and my aim here is to see if anything will stop the automata from moving. So the first thing I want to do is work out where the automata is in the linked list. There's not going to be very many automata on this linked list, perhaps two or three as a maximum, so I'm just using the find function to return an iterator to that particular automata. And now we can go through the conditions I just outlined to check if it can move or not. So if this particular body is at the front of that list, we know that there's no traffic in front of it directly on this track. However, any tracks following the end node may contain vehicles that overlap with part of this track. So we take the exit node and we go through its list of tracks and we check that those tracks are not equal to the current track, because we don't want to check the track we're already on, there's no point. And we can also check, well, is there anything at all on that track? If there isn't, then clearly it can't be overlapping with our current track. I'm going to add to the automata body class three more variables. One which represents its position in world space, one which represents its position along the current track, and the length of the body of the automata, or the vehicle length. We're now checking to see if any of the tracks in front of the one that I'm currently on contain a vehicle that overlaps with my track space. If so, I'm calculating the distance from the start of the next track section to the back of the vehicle that's on it. If that distance isn't large enough for me to move, then there's no space. I can't move. But if the distance is OK, then I'm going to record that distance and use it as a coefficient in my formula for updating the automata's current position. This line of code, I've got a little horrible constant here. I probably will abstract that out to the Lua file, but that represents the distance in world space of a gap that must be left between the vehicles. So this checks the condition that any successive tracks from my target node that contain vehicles make sure that the vehicles don't overlap into the space I'm about to move into. And I only needed to do that if I was at the front of the queue. If I'm not at the front of the queue, then I want to check my own track for the vehicles that might be in front of me. And that's easy enough, because I've got an iterator to my position in the list of vehicles on that track, 
I can just decrement that iterator to get the vehicle that's in front of me. And in a similar way to the method above, I just work out the distance between the front of the vehicle in front of me plus its length plus a small distance between the two cars. There's that 0.1f again. And if I've got enough space, I can move. If I haven't, I have to stop. If I'm allowed to move, then update my position along the track in accordance with f elapsed time by a certain velocity. In this case, I've fixed it at 0.5. Again, this will be a parameter that will be associated with the automata. So these are the things that will abstract out to the Lua file to set the properties of the vehicles. And here I'm using the distance to the car in front as a function to accelerate and decelerate the object. If I'm far enough away from the object in front, then this one will ensure that I'm moving at maximum speed. If the car in front is really far away, then I'm going to clamp the distance to be the length of the current track that I'm on. So now we've moved the automata, we need to assess its position. Has it reached an end node? Well, that's easy enough to do. We just see if our current position is greater than the length of the track that we're on. The first check is, can it transition through the node at the end of the track? In this case, it can. So I'm going to reset the position of the object to what is effectively zero on the next piece of track. And I'm doing that by subtracting the length of the current track because this will never be an exact science. As each frame ticks over, the position of the object may be one side of the node and then the other. It's very unlikely to ever be precisely at the node. So any overspill of position is absorbed here. Regardless, I've hit a node, so I need to choose a new node to follow. If the exit node that I've hit only has two tracks in its track list, then it's only got an entry and an exit. So I just need to find the element in the list that isn't equal to my current track. However, if I've got more than two tracks associated with my exit node, then I need to choose one at random and I need to ensure that it's non-blocking. And this is a little bit hacky. There's probably more clever ways to go about doing it, but I'm going to sit in a while loop until a suitable track is chosen. Fortunately, there's not that many permutations for it to choose from, but it'll choose a random number and find the track in the list at that random number's location. If that track in the list is not the track that I've come in on and it's non-blocking, then select that as my new track. Now I've successfully found a track, I want to set the automata's origin node to the exit node of the previous track. I want to pop it off the front of the list for the previous track, switch the automata's current track to the new track, and push the automata onto the back of the list of the new track. If it wasn't possible for me to switch tracks due to any reason, then I'm going to clamp my position at the position of the exit node and wait for the next frame to make another decision. Perhaps the stop pattern has changed for that junction. Now the start of this if block, we check to see had we reached the end of the track. If we've not reached the end of the track, we don't need to select nodes and new tracks or anything like that, we just need to travel along it. Now we've already moved along it by increasing the auto pause value, but I'm also now going to update the world position by using our get position function as described before. It's important that when we're spawning vehicles or pedestrians that we're doing so in a sensible way. I can't just choose random nodes and tracks to put pedestrians or vehicles on. For example, I don't want pedestrians walking along the road and I don't want the cars driving along the pavement. So for each road section type, I'm nominating a safe piece of track in order to put the respective type of automata on. And if we go back to our cell road class uh, where we're creating the tracks, this is what I meant by the safe pedestrian track and uh, safe car track variables. So we're just storing one per road type, which will be the track that we spawn a new vehicle or pedestrian on. And we know that the vehicle is going to travel in the right direction if we spawn it on that track, and we know it's not going to be in the wrong place. I'm going to add to our main game class now the ability to have automata within the game. I'm just going to maintain a linked list of pointers to all of the automata. And they're pointers because later on we're going to abuse polymorphism to alter the behavior of the automata. Pedestrians move slower than cars, for example. I'm also going to add two functions, one that spawns a pedestrian and one that spawns a vehicle. And both these functions take the location of a cell, the cell in which to spawn the particular object. So I'm just going to add these functions to the bottom. So for spawning a pedestrian, we've got a particular cell, x and y, we get a pointer to it, and we interrogate that cell to say, please give me your safe pedestrian track. 
Then we go and create a new automata and establish it as being part of that track and add it to the list of automata on that track and set a node. We then also push that automata to the list of global automata maintained by the main game engine. For now, spawning a pedestrian and spawning a vehicle are identical. I didn't want to go into creating yet more classes for this video, it's already terribly long enough. So to differentiate between pedestrians and cars, I'm just setting the length of the vehicle to be different. So for pedestrians it's very small, and for cars it's a bit larger. In on user update, after we've updated the cells, I'm going to update the automata. And since they're in a linked list, I'm going to use an auto for function to scroll through them. I'm just going to call the update auto function we've just implemented, passing along f elapsed time. But if the automata is too far away from the current camera position, so I'm just taking its position and the camera's location looking at the magnitude, if it's greater than 5, then I want to despawn it. I want it to disappear from view. And that's easy enough to do. All I need to do is disconnect it from the track that it's currently on, which I can get because the automata maintained its current track, and I ask it to remove it. And then I erase the automata from the allocated memory, so it's not going to leak. Anything that I erase, I'm going to set to null pointer, because it'll still exist in the list. It is, after all, just a list of pointers, even though one of them is null. But then I'll remove from that list any pointer that is null. So that's great if we've got automata and we want to remove them, but right now we haven't got any to start with. So I want to maintain a minimum number of automata. In this case, I'm going to maintain 20. And so if the list has a size that is less than 20, we need to spawn a new one. And this is a largely stochastic process. I'm going to have several attempts at trying to find a cell for this frame, which is a safe cell for me to actually spawn a vehicle or a pedestrian on. I don't want it to always find a cell, because it could stall the game. And it all adds a little bit to the randomness, which is, which is quite nice. I think it adds a bit more realism to the city, rather than being able to see uh, all of the patterns that form due to the poor quality of the random numbers. So I sit in my attempt loop, and I choose a cell at random, on a circular boundary around where the camera is. And that circular boundary has got a radius of 3, so it's going to be out of view for most of the player's viewing. It's easy to forget that when we're in edit mode we're quite zoomed out looking at the whole city, but when you're playing uh, you're really only going to be looking at perhaps 3 or 4 cells across the screen. So we're going to pick a cell on the boundary of that circle which is off screen. Then I'm going to check, is that cell a road? Is it capable of actually having something spawned on it? Because roads are the only thing that transport anything around. If it's true, then I'm going to basically flip a coin and decide to spawn a pedestrian or spawn a vehicle. I think we'll offload this to the Lua script at some point, because it'd be nice to have some vehicles be rarer than others. You might want lots of taxis, but very few Ferraris, for example. And finally, the last thing for us to do with Automata is render it. And I want to render them, for now, just as circles on top of everything else that's there. And this is just going to be quick and simple. I'm going to iterate through the list and render a circle at the position of the automata in world space. Um, I'm going to, again, use its uh, length to decide whether it's a car or a pedestrian uh, in, in terms of both radius of circle and colour. And so let's take a look. Got our green plane, let's just draw a road network on here. Make sure we've got some junctions. And we'll classify those as roads. Currently, we're limit the centre of the camera is effectively where the player is. So if we zoom in enough and start travelling about, we can see we've got traffic behaviour as expected, and we can see the pedestrians walking around too. The stop patterns are controlling the traffic. The pedestrian just crossing the road there. Let's see what happens when the traffic is starting uh, to flow. Well, that's good. We're getting a mixture of particularly valid routes that the traffic can follow. We've got some more pedestrians coming in. We could choose to follow one of these round, and it will perfectly exist quite happily, because it's never going to be despawned, it's always within the field of view of the player. And we see as it approaches the other cars, they leave a gap in between them, that's that little fiddly 0.1 value I was talking about earlier. But if I zoom out, uh, we can see the spawning and despawning process occur. 
uh, because we're looking at a small radius around the center of the field of view. The player will never play at this particular level, but we could always increase the radius of the spawning depending on the zoom level during the game. However, I anticipate this is probably the typical playing height. Occasionally it might zoom out to this. But hey, that's all fine tuning to come in the next part of the series. And so there you have it. I'm not going to show uh, how to code the car. It's exactly the same as the first video, except I've replaced the 2D sprite with a 3D model. I think the end result is quite compelling. Uh, the city does feel vibrant and alive, and it's nice to see things behaving as you'd expect them to. One thing that I might change is the nature of the stop patterns. Right now they're not particularly clever. Uh, just stopping the traffic in one direction can lead to traffic jams, particularly as we increase the automata count. So there's definitely room for improvement there. But on the whole, I think it, it adds enough detail. We've got a pedestrian stuck in the middle of the road there, so we'll have to look at that. I think there's enough detail uh, to go about posing an interesting challenge for the player. Don't forget, these cars and pedestrians are really obstacles for the player to avoid or steal or target, uh, depending on what the game is requiring them to do. Quite like that. Look at that. It's a nice traffic jam there. And even though some of it went off screen, it's not despawned, and that's because the radius is slightly further out. So I can drive back down. Hopefully they're still there. So I know it's been a long video, but it's covered quite a few interesting points, I think. I'm going to zoom back out and we'll watch the spawning follow the car as it drives around. The next part of this series is going to be about physics and collision detection uh, between the cars and other cars and the cars and scenery. And we'll also replace the yellow dots and uh, pink dots with pedestrians and vehicles. We're going to start really getting into the game dynamics of it all after that point. I don't know when the next video will be. It won't be next week. Uh, it'll probably be a couple of months away. It's like I say, it's a big project. I don't get to spend as much time on it as I would like. Um, and I like to create the intermediate sort of uh, secondary step videos in between this one. However, if you've enjoyed it, and I know it's been a long one, a big thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. Come and join us on the Discord server. And uh, download the code, hack it. If you want to create models, um, I'm just find me out on the Discord server. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that the community want to get involved. They want to start designing things. Uh, there is a bit of a draft specification. Uh, come and seek it out. And until next time, take care.